All right, so we were talking about personas and scenarios. We talked about constructing personas. And I'd mentioned that personas are very closely tied in with scenarios. So what is a scenario? Well, a scenario is basically a written description of a persona who is achieving a goal through a set of tasks in a certain context. So it's essentially a narrative. It's like a little story that tells you about a day in the life of your particular persona. Now, this isn't just so that we get creative and have creative writing. This is, again, a design tool. Because especially these days, where our work is becoming more and more integrated in our daily lives, right? the use of technology is more and more ubiquitous, knowing what's going on in our lives when we're using that technology is really, really critical because it helps you understand your user's goals your, and your user's needs. So if I'm using Microsoft Word, right, I may have a small goal to finish whatever document I'm working on, but it fits into a larger picture. And so that's what scenarios help us understand. So it helps designers and developers understand how the system will really be used, the context that it will be used in, and when I give you an example, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Most of the time it's based on user research or a use case and it expands upon that use case. So usually it's based on information you've gathered about your users. And as you're going through the design process, one of the things that you'll find is that your scenarios may actually become more and more detailed because you're getting into how your users use the product more in depth. So early on, your scenarios will be more higher level and as you go on through the design process, then it will become more detailed. Now another thing that's really great that people tend to forget about scenarios is you know when you're designing you know, and building a product, eventually you do need to test it, right? And who has ever had to come up with a test case? How fun is it? Not so much. This can make it more fun. Well, it can. But seriously, one of the things that is a great advantage of creating scenarios is you are very, you can very easily then translate it into a test scenario. So it can be used as the basis of usability task questions. So you don't have to try to reinvent the wheel. So they're very, very powerful in that way. Now, of course, when you're creating a scenario, it's really important that you think about the context. What is the context the product is going to be used in? It can be very dramatically. Right? It could be it's a handheld, and I'm going to be walking while I'm using it, or I'm going to be sitting down while I'm using it. Hopefully, you're not driving while you're using it, although that's something you need to think about. So that's going to be different from a desktop, or a laptop, or a tablet, or some of the, the newer, I guess, technologies that are coming out, like was it Google Glasses and someone's coming out with a watch, a smart watch. Does anyone know who's coming out with a smart watch? Samsung. Oh, Samsung and their, 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 their smart watch. I'm sorry? Actually, there's... Someone put the phone in your watch? There's one called the Pebble and it's like an interface that connects to your phone. Oh, is that that's from that startup company? Yeah. Okay, so the pebbles, the pebbles from the startup company, so you can control your phone from your watch. Yeah, yeah pretty cool, right? I don't know if I'd use it, but it's pretty cool. So those sorts of things, you got to think about how it's going to be used. All right, so here are some of the questions that you want to think about when you're thinking about creating a scenario, particularly with the context, because remember, context is really important. What setting or settings will the product be used in? Is it going to be used in a classroom? Is it going to be used out in the middle of the Everglades? Is it going to be used in space? It can make a difference. Will it be used for extended amounts of time? In other words, when someone is using that product, how much time are they going to be spending using it? Are they going to be sitting in front of a, something like a word processor or you may be sitting there for an hour or several hours? or several days? 
Is it something that even say is like a watch where I may be wearing it all the time, but when I use it, I'm just going to use it for, say, 30 seconds. But it may be 30 seconds once a day, or is it 30 seconds 100 times a day? Important things to think about. Is the persona frequently interrupted? You kind of forget about this. When they're trying to use this, this product or this technology, how often are they interrupted? Because when we're interrupted, what happens? Your locus of attention shift, shifts to something else. And then you have to shift back to what you're doing. Do you think this has an effect on how you should design the product? Absolutely, yes. Are there multiple users on a single workstation or device? Now, this is something that, you know, we as technology people kind of take for granted. Non-technology people don't. So this is why it's important to bring up. Let me give you an example. When I was working in industry, there was a uh, group of people where I was working that wanted a uh, database to help track, I don't know, something financial. I can't even remember what. It's going to be small and simple. Well, they came to the IT department and they asked, well, you know, this is what we want. Can you put it together? Oh, yeah, sure, no problem. Oh, but we want to use Access. So, of course, our question to them was how many people are going to be accessing it, accessing the database? Oh, well, you know, there's five. Okay, well, then what we'll do is if you really want to use an Access interface, I'm not sure why they wanted to use Access interface, but they did. So we will put together the, uh, we'll design the, uh, a small database for you, put it on the back end, and then will help you design the access interfaces. Okay, no problem. Well, they came back shortly thereafter and said, oh, we don't need your help anymore. We designed the database and we designed the interface and access. So we proceeded to tell them, well, okay, would you like us to look at it? No, 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 we're fine, it's simple and easy. Okay, but aren't you gonna have five people accessing it? Well, yeah. Who knows what the problem is? Anyone? What is access made for? Is it made for servers? It's made for a single user. It's made for a single user on a desktop, for example. Actually, it's primarily designed for a user on a desktop. How well do you think it works when you ha now have multiple users trying to access the data in that access database, which was just sitting on a computer? Think that's going to work? It's actually not. When you're dealing with real databases on servers where, where you are having multiple people access them, there's a, there are a lot of controls, there's a lot of constraints to make sure that, they, that you are not going to have conflicts and how those conflicts are going to be resolved so that you don't have dirty data. That's not the case in something like access. So it's really important. What ended up happening in this case was actually exactly what we told them would happen. They ended up completely screwing up their database because they had two people accessing it at the same time and making changes to the same fields. And they ended up with a mess. They had to throw the whole thing out. Not such a good idea. So very important. Now, another thing, when it comes to the number of users, do you think it's important? Okay, we already know that it's, multiple users are going to be accessing it. Is it important to know how many users you, you expect to be accessing the system at the same time? Yes. Now, what's the biggest example of this right now in the news? The Obama Health Care website, the federal website. All right, it was designed for, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people, something like, I don't know, 800,000 people or something. And the first day they had, what, like 2 million people trying to access it. So what happened? It crashed. Right, because you don't have those resources. Very important for you to keep that in mind. 
Now, of course, there are whole other usability issues with that, which we can discuss at another time because I think it's fascinating. But anyway, so really important things to keep in mind. All right, what other products will be used? Either in conjunction with this product, because now rarely do we use just one product, or on the same system. How will they be used together? What primary activities does the persona need to perform to meet his or her goals? What is the expected end result of the product? What does the user expect to be able to accomplish? And how much complexity is permissible based on persona skill and frequency of use? Because we have a tendency to make things too complex. We want to know really what is it that they're doing. So you want to remember that scenarios are pretty much used to help convey the experience that our personas have with using technology. And of course, if we're designing a new system, we have to look at current technology and how they use that current technology. So it's essentially telling you a story, short stories. But they're telling you a story. Now, there are a lot of different ways that you can have scenarios. We're going to focus on written scenarios. Those tend to be the most common. But there are also video uh, scenarios. There are audio scenarios. There are pictorial scenarios. We're going to focus on the written ones. So with written scenarios, they allow the user to imagine themselves in a given situation. Kind of like when you're reading a book and you start visualizing things. You guys read books for fun, right? Yes. So when you're reading a book, you start visualizing what's going to happen. That's what we're doing with our scenarios. So this has a good side and a bad side. What do you think the good side is? It really helps engage the person. It gives you a much better understanding of and much more interest in this persona, who your users are. OK, what can be a drawback? What can be bad about it? Yeah, when it comes to specifics, when it comes to, real, to really looking at the details, because we may get the details wrong. But that's why when we are first starting to write scenarios, we want to write them at a higher level. And then as we learn more about our users, then we go ahead and we add uh, more details. So taking scenarios, which of course we are using as a design tool to help empathize with our our users, add scenarios to that, and it really, really greatly improves how much you understand and empathize and connect with your users. So let's look at a quick example. And this is actually from your book. It came up earlier. Hold on. All right, there we go. So this is a persona named Vivian. And if I recall correctly, I think she is a uh, real estate agent. So here are some context scenarios to give you an idea of a day in the life and how she uses technology. While getting ready in the morning, Vivian uses her phone to check her email. It has a large enough screen and quick connection time, so it is more convenient than booting up a computer as she rushes to make her daughter Alice a sandwich for school. What do you see in there that's important? What does it tell you about the user? She doesn't have much time. Yeah, she doesn't have much time. Convenience is important. And having that handheld where she can quickly have, have a technology where she can quickly pick it up and check something is very important. Okay, Vivian sees an email from her newest client, Frank, who wants to see a house this afternoon. The device has his contact information, so now she can call him with a simple action right from the email. In other words, probably one tap, one swipe, something like that. Now, what I want you to notice in this one is it doesn't tell you, is it that she taps it? Is it that she swipes it? Is it that she gives it a voice command? Right? It's more generic than that. Because what we're trying to convey here is, again, Convenience is important. Now, why do you not add it at this point? Because you don't know. You haven't designed it yet. 
And you may actually come up with a better idea than what's already out there. Because remember, the focus here is not on the technology, it is on the user and your persona. Make sense? Do you want to go through another one or you think you guys think you got, you got it? Another one? Yes? Okay. Let's jump over to four. After sending Alice off to school, Vivian heads to the real estate office to gather some papers for another appointment. Her phone has already updated her Outlook appointments. So the rest of the office knows where she'll be in the afternoon. Now, there are two aspects of this that are really important. One is one that we've already talked about, right? Where this again tells you she's running, she's running very quickly going to the office, right? She doesn't have to actually do anything to manually update her appointments. It's done automatically. There's one problem with this, however, that I really do not like. Does anyone know what that is? Or want to take a guess? If we're focusing on the user and not the technology. Well, hopefully we'll be paperless, but that wasn't what I was thinking about. That actually could be an issue. That's actually a great idea. It's not what I was thinking, but whether, oh, sorry, I have to repeat it. So the, she, she doesn't have a choice as to whether the office knows where she's going to be at what time. That could certainly be an issue that you really want to think about. So let me point out quickly what I really don't like about this. How many of you look, use Outlook? Two. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Why is there Outlook here? Because Outlook, well, with Outlook you can manage your appointments as well, you know, your contacts, it's pretty much all in one. Oh, yeah, but I do that already and I don't use Outlook. I mean, you can have several accounts as well, everything in just one place. Oh, but I already do that. I don't use Outlook. Oh. So that's why it's a problem. Outlook actually should not be mentioned. Because not all of your users may be using Outlook. Right? So if we look in this room, this is a room of what? 30? Something like that? Rough guess? Two people use Outlook. Now, of course, you talk to non-IT people and they think everyone look, uses Outlook. Don't you use, use Outlook? No. Very, very important. This, in my opinion, should not be there. You need something more generic. Now, where you may want to include a product is later on down the road if you are creating something very, very specific only for one company and you know what they happen to use. Other than that, I would not put in a specific name of product. Make sense? Okay, you guys got it? Awesome. Go back to our desktop. All right, so those are personas and scenarios. Any questions? Okay, great.